Greetings and salutations, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Storyteller's Corner. I'm your host, Joshua T. Calkins Churushi, also known as Byron Sidious. Got kind of a, a double feature here. Not only am I going to be doing yet another video slash audio uh, presentation here on a political figure, which is an area, a topic of conversation I don't typically indulge in, but um, I'm going to sadly have to possibly pop a few bubbles. This is a a small observation or a few observations regarding Vivek Ramaswamy. And as you can see by the title of this video, I present to you Vivek Ramaswamy, Necromancer. When people show you who they are, believe them. Maya Angelou. This is a talking point that has been parroted by a lot of folks in the uh, current events, social, socioeconomic, geopolitical talking spaces frequently lately. Um, It's been said by uh, such notable marked figures as Lex Fridman and Joe Rogan and Peter Boghossian and James Lindsay. The the typical round of folks who are oftentimes uh, gathered up into a clutch and dismissed as, oh, those are fringe right people or they're associated with the fringe right but this is a valuable truism, I have found at least, when going through my life. When people show you or tell you who they are, you might be best served by believing them. At the very least, to exercise some caution if they're throwing out a red flag early on that you should pay attention to it. It would seem that a lot of people on the political right are not taking that message to heart when they talk about or listen to Vivek Ramaswamy as a candidate in the Republican primary campaign season. They're not paying attention. And I'm not trying to be dismissive. I'm not trying to be a prick. I'm not trying to be nasty. And I don't intend to use this time to sway anybody politically away from supporting Mr. Ramaswamy if they so choose to vote for him or if they so choose to try and convince people to gather some kind of groundswell of support to to propose that he should take a number two seat or uh, run with Donald Trump on the Republican ticket as his vice presidential uh, nominee. It's not even like I really give much of a shite who's on the Republican ticket. I'm probably not going to vote for them. I'm probably not going to vote for the Democrats either. For damn certain not if it's Joe Biden again. Fuck all that. But there are some concerning things for me to have observed. As I mentioned in my last video, I've been listening to a lot of interviews and stump speech presentations by Ramaswamy since about three or four months, two or three months ago, I'll be honest. So I've only been paying attention for a couple of months to him. But he started apparently back in February with this, uh, the rollout of this campaign. And I I was interested because he was well-spoken. He seemed very well-read. He had a sharp, acerbic wit. I enjoyed that presentation and that style. He also had a definitive and clear sense of wordplay. And he mentioned on several occasions one of the books that he has written. He has written, I think, three at this juncture. But he kept making reference to a book entitled Woke Inc., which in my previous video I performed a review of. And 
combining certain observations of his stump speeches and reflecting upon what he wrote in Woke Inc., come to a few observations. Observation one for me is that Royvent, the pharmaceutical development and sales company that he you know, that he founded and operated and made a ton of money with, its mainly known operant tactic was to scoop up pharmaceutical products, drug products, that had been left behind by other pharmaceutical companies. Effectively, Royvent was able to cut through some of the R&D process, save themselves some money by not having to start from scratch, and then discover effective ways to chemically and pharmacologically resurrect these products. They raised these drugs from the dead. Do you understand now why I titled this video Necromancer? Now, this tactic of repurposing a drug that's been abandoned, this is effectively what pharma bro Martin Shkreli did with the... Uh, I can't remember exactly what the drug it was that he was doing that with. If it was something for diabetes or if it was the EpiPen drugs. I can't remember. But that's what he got lambasted for. Was taking advantage of this drug cycling out of uh, patent or trademark ownership. And, you know, jacking up the price to an outrageous degree. And like I said in my review of Woke Inc., Vivek tried to kind of defend this behavior because he said it didn't, you know, the cost didn't actually end up getting, you know, right into the pocketbooks of consumers of this drug because the, the, the shocking uh, price hike was defrayed along the way to the insurance companies. But here's the problem. Those insurance companies are then going to pass that cost on to the customers in the form of jacked up uh, you know, plan costs. Your deductible is going to go through the roof or your coverage plan is going to go through the roof. And your employer, if you're like 90% of people who get their insurance, their health insurance from their or through their employers, the employers are not going to cover as much of the cost of the plan to save themselves some money on their own bottom line. And then you, the employee, have to pitch in, chip in even more than you already were. So the cost is still going to end up hitting everyday people, Mr. Ramaswamy. But of course you would defend this behavior. After all, it's what you did at Royvent. You scooped up products that were left behind, finished the research and development, and pumped them out into the market. Now, that's not a criticism of the usefulness or the benefit of the drugs in question because some of them have been absolutely critical for the improvement of life of the patients who take those drugs. It's been critically important for some of them. And so kudos for that. But let's not pretend that this was done out of pure altruism. It was done because you saw a need and rather than having to start, start from scratch, you picked up something that was already partly done, cleaned it up, finished the work, repackaged it, renamed it, and sold it. That seems to be, at least to me, what Vivek is trying to do with the America first slash MAGA ethos. The progenitor of this socio-political or geopolitical through line or, or bundle of concepts, this America first MAGA thing, its progenitor and current flag carrier, Donald Trump, is under a lot of legal slash political threat 
So his commanding hold on this system, this product, is inevitably flagging. Even if he should reclaim the office of the presidency, there's a couple of factors to bear in mind. Trump is a, an older fellow, his own physical health could suddenly take a bad turn. And B, Trump is term limited. He can only serve one more term if elected. Someone will eventually have to take up the reins of this America first ethos if it's going to continue. Whether or not it should is not what I'm talking about here. That's a question for a whole other day and for people far smarter and far better read on these matters than yours truly. But being young, energetic, and well-read, as well as dialectically polished and legally knowledgeable, Vivek could easily bide his time and take up the reins. Fascinating, no? But again, this is just an observation. I, I could be wrong. I'm not necessarily ascribing sinister intent or motive here. Just an observation. For those of you who are interested in Vivek or who do consider yourselves conservatives or American first people, consider these things because I spent a few days looking around all over my usual scouring grounds using Google, DuckDuckGo, the Brave Browser, Firefox, Internet Explorer, and I searched for Vivek, I posed the question, is Vivek um, uh, what was the, I'm trying to think of the term exactly, how I, I have it written down, hold up, look here. Is Vivek appropriating America first? That's, that's how I punched in the query. And I didn't see a result that came anywhere close to matching this query. I'm an idiot. Okay? I don't have a great investigative mind, folks. But none of the pundits and members of the geopolitical talking headspace made these observations. No one brought this up. How? How is it that a genre storyteller schmuck from the Midwest, that's me, made this observation just now and nobody else thought of this? I'm not a brilliant person, folks. So I'm a little disturbed that nobody else seems to have caught on to this. Now, Vivek claims he's, quote, not a number two guy, something he adamantly held to when talking with Bill Maher on his program. What's fascinating here is Vivek's follow-up exposition. He says that his thought process is, quote, how can I use my particular talents to have the greatest impact here? I just don't think that's in the cards as vice president. For one, let, let's take a look at some other vice presidents throughout time who are still notable and have had impacts on the culture. We've got Al Gore with his, well, climate concerns. He still managed to remain relevant for quite some time in part thanks to Man Pear Pig in South Park, but also thanks to, you know, his, his climate alarmism and uh, his film An Inconvenient Truth, which I made reference to in, in uh, Woke Inc. because Vivek made use of those exact words rather cleverly. That should not escape anybody's notice, by the way. He quoted the former vice president, Clearly, the number two guy can have an impact. And did we forget all about Danny Quayle, who was a, a long-running source of great humor, who was joked about as, quote, assassination insurance? No one would think twice 
about taking out George uh, George Bush Sr. because his VP was such a just train wreck in waiting. And then you've got Dick Cheney, the Emperor Palpatine of Vice Presidents. This guy was the architect behind the Second Iraq War. You mean to tell me that the number two can't leave a lasting impact on the world? Check your history, Mr. Ramaswamy, because there are so many jokes made about this man who cackled his tits off at Louis Black's performance at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, so much so that, to quote Louis Black, he thought that a hand would reach up and choke him. But honestly, all of that aside, I suspect that this perspective of Vivek's is heavily informed by his upbringing as a member of the Brahmin caste in the traditional Indian Hindu family. Generally speaking, the Brahmin are a kind of top class of almost aristocracy in that caste system. Historically uh, serving their culture as priests, leaders, and educators. Vivek was literally born into top dog status, as he informed us of in Woke Inc. Folks, Ever since he hit the campaign trail, Vivek has mentioned this book quite frequently. He has referred to it quite frequently. When people ask him to clarify his positions on various topics, he's mentioned or said, well, you know, I talked about this in my book, Woke Inc. He's been telling you since February, hey, Here's this thing I wrote. Go read it. It seems clear to me that a lot of you didn't. Because if you had, you would have seen early on that he told us who he was. And we should have believed him. Now, it's not for me to say, as I mentioned before, whether people should or should not support his endeavors politically. I'm not here to do that. I'm not a great political pundit or analyst. My comprehension of nuanced geopolitical realities is marginal at best. But I do understand people, at least those whom I'm able to observe in their behaviors. Because people are universally what we base characters in fiction upon. The greatest stories, the greatest mythologies touch us deep in our souls because the character traits that we assign to heroes and villains and monsters, they are traits and aspects of us. That's why those stories resonate because there is such a depth of truth in them. Now, I made the joke in the title of this video, Vivek Ramaswamy, Necromancer. If you think that's an insult, I would invite you to go on Facebook and uh, look up the Facebook group Tiamat's Tavern. It's a group of folks who are tabletop role-playing game enthusiasts and hobbyists and there's plenty of memes galore and just posts of people talking about their favorite necromancer characters and how there's quite a bit of fun to be played by, you know, presenting the necromancer as something help, someone helpful, uh, someone who just wants to provide free and safety first labor in things like, you know, mining operations, where if there's a tunnel collapse, uh, nobody died because the people working in that tunnel were already dead. Ha ha. We're just reburying them. It's recycling. You find a lot of jokey, hacky shit like that, but it's funny. It's funny because it's lighthearted and because it's a different look at the necromancer. So don't immediately assume I'm being insulting by pointing out this observation. You're afraid to interpret what I'm implying by all of this, however you'd like. 
just remember that in the hierarchy of literary analysis and analyses of any kind, the top level is not interpretation. The top level is clarification. So if you really want to know what I think, just ask. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. I ask that you take care of yourselves, and as always, and especially when someone has a book out there and then they crop up into the public consciousness, keep reading. <laughs>